everyone, and welcome to the Sci-Fi Seminar Series, Healthy Housing, Exploring the Interface Between Public Health and Municipal Property Standards. My name is Rachel McArthur, and I am the Sci-Fi Ontario Professional Development Counselor. Please remain in lecture mode for the duration of the call. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat pod located in the bottom right of the screen. So today our presenters are Helen Doyle, Bob Hart, Victoria Vicarelli, and John Burnett. Helen Doyle has recently retired as Healthy Environments Manager with York Region Public Health, and Helen now volunteers with the Ontario Public Health Association, sharing the OPHA Environmental Health Workgroup. Helen contributes to advocacy and policy development on environmental health issues, represents OPHA on a number of provincial tables and committees, presents OPHA research and advocacy work at conferences and webinars, and engages public health professionals and partners in policy development and knowledge exchange activities. Helen is a certified public health inspector with over 30 years of experience in public health programs relating to environmental investigation, environmental health research, policy development, community engagement, health promotion, and project management. Bob Hart. With a career in public health spanning over 35 years, Bob has significant experience managing a diverse range of programs. Prior to his retirement from full-time work earlier this year, Bob managed the Healthy Environment Program for the Gray Bruce Health Unit. It was in this role that he developed a keen interest in the relationship between housing and health. He is currently a member of the Rent Safe Project team where he continues to work with others to explore the root causes of unhealthy housing. Vittoria Vicarelli has 12 years of experience in the field of public health and is a senior public health inspector for the Healthy Environments Program with York Region Public Health. Her current portfolio includes indoor air quality and responding to complaints of unsafe rental housing conditions. Vittoria is a member of York Region's Public Health Branch Health Equity Champions Committee, Diversity and Inclusion Staff Committee, and is also a Rent Safe Project team member. John Burnett has been employed for 30 years with Niagara Region Public Health. Since taking his position of team leader in 2000, Healthy Environments has been part of his portfolio. Effectively addressing community housing issues has been a long-standing concern for both himself and his department. Thank you, Rachel. Tonight, this is Helen. I'm going to be providing a brief overview of the linkages between housing and health and the various contributing factors, including the social determinants of health that support or detract from healthy housing. I'll then touch on the Rent Safe Initiative to work across sectors to address unhealthy housing conditions for tenants living on low income. My colleagues, Bob, John, and Victoria will talk about the work at local health units in collaborating with municipalities to address housing concerns. We will end with a discussion on how health units and environmental public health professionals can become more engaged in ensuring healthy housing for all Ontarians. So not unlike many of the issues that we face in public health, the relationship between housing and health is complex and multifaceted. People living in housing below standards face disadvantages across a range of health, social, and economic dimensions. Housing conditions that are below standard expose people to health hazards such as poor air quality, unsafe water and mold, and other conditions that contribute to poor health including structural issues, noise, inadequate heating and cooling, and safety concerns. Poor housing conditions are an important determinant of health and an often under-recognized source of health risk for Ontarians, especially for low-income and marginalized tenants, including vulnerable subpopulations, such as seniors and children. Persons on low income lacking social support or experiencing mental health issues or racial discrimination are more likely to face unhealthy housing conditions. According to Public Health Agency of Canada's 2018 Key Health Inequalities in Canada report, pronounced inequalities in housing below standard persist among different population groups in Canada. In 2011, as many as 3.8 million Canadian households, or approximately 30%, were living in housing below standard. So while affordability is the most common reason for households to be living in housing below standard, housing in need of major repair and overcrowding were also of great concern. 
The proportion of Canadians in the lowest income group who live in housing below standards is 7.4 times greater than the proportion in the highest income group who live in housing below standards. The prevalence of housing below standards among recent immigrants is two point times the, the is two times this prevalence among Canadian-born people, and the percentage of visible minority Canadians in housing below standards is 1.8 times the percentage of non-visible minorities. Housing below standards by adults who are unemployed but looking for work is also lower than that of employed adults, and as well for is also high for First Nations and Inuit households. What's interesting to note is that Inuit households and housing below standards fall below the adequacy standard versus the affordability standard. As noted in the, the health equities, health inequities report, failure to meet housing standards can result in a greater exposure to physical and environmental toxins and allergens while also negatively impacting self-reported health and mental health. And this report, it's on the, the website if you go to Public Health Agency of Canada's website, it highlighted the need for policy interventions that affect the broader environment, including socioeconomic conditions, housing conditions, and the availability of adequate, affordable rental properties. So based on this information and some of our own research, we recognize that there are many reasons why we need to act collectively to improve housing conditions. We know that many tenants face challenges in addressing these issues. Low-income or marginalized communities face compounding health determinants. Tenants are on low income have a limited capacity to change their living circumstances. And we've heard from service providers and tenants that barriers tenants face include mental health issues, fear of being evicted, or not knowing who to call if they have a housing issue that they feel is impacting their health. We also recognize that various agencies play an important role in improving housing conditions, but there's a need to address the barriers that the service providers are experiencing, whether it's capacity, resources, gaps, or understanding of each other's mandates. Most importantly, we recognize that action must be coordinated, informed by knowledge and evidence, and mutually supportive. The Ontario Public Health Standards also recognizes the need to address healthy housing through collaborative efforts. Explicit reference to this is in the Healthy Environments and Climate Change Guideline, which requires health units to work with municipalities to support policy changes, for example, property standards, bylaws, and standards relating to housing conditions, pest control, and temperature control, to improve health outcomes and address the impacts of the social determinants of health. In addition, there's broad reference in the Healthy Environments Program standard relating to collaborating with municipalities and others to reduce health hazard exposure and promote healthy built environment. There's reference in the health equity standard about cross-sectoral collaboration with municipalities and others to decrease health inequities. And it may be debatable, the health hazard response protocol speaks to inspecting facilities that serve priority populations that may present a risk of exposure to health hazards. So it's debatable whether that is speaking to uh, rental or that would include rental and social housing, but it does mention shelters and other facilities that serve as priority populations. So one solution to improving housing conditions is RentSafe. RentSafe is an initiative to build collaboration across multiple sectors to ensure healthy housing conditions for tenants living on low income. It began in 2015, led by the Canadian Partnership for Children's Health and the Environment, funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, and supported by multiple partners. We came together because collectively we were motivated to act. There was a strong interest and recognition amongst health and social service sectors that the system could be improved. And while RentSafe began as a three-year initiative, we have plans to continue work based on our findings and the momentum and interest we've built up through our collaborative efforts. In phase one of RentSafe, we conducted Ontario-wide baseline research on capacities and challenges related to addressing on-fit housing conditions experienced by low-income tenants. We explored the types of conditions that tenants are experiencing as well as their experience in trying to get help. We worked with various professional sectors to better understand their capacity to respond adequately to unhealthy housing conditions. We interacted with housing providers about the challenges that they face, in particularly circumstances of small-scale landlords. We also reviewed existing laws and regulations in Ontario with a view of seeing how their application could be improved and where there are gaps that need to be filled. Bob and I will speak briefly to some of our sector survey results. 
In phase two, we completed the baseline report, expanded our stakeholder engagement through a rent safe roundtable, and that resulted in multiple recommendations framed around the theme of healthy housing for all. And in phase three, we continue with capacity building and outreach. We've developed resources for tenants and professional sectors. This is all on the rent safe website. We've also developed a rent safe connector tool that I will speak to later. So the public health survey, and many of you may have seen this survey or helped respond to it. The purpose of that survey was to better understand health units response to indoor environmental health issues in rental housing. We had a range of responses and they all they related to things like the interpretation of the mandate in the public health standards, the capacity of health units to respond, some of the challenges they face and, and compounding factors that they mentioned, such as maybe landlord-tenant relationships and mental health issues. They also um, expressed concern about the, ad the adequate supply of safe, healthy rental housing. And while the majority of health units responded that housing conditions impact the health of marginalized populations in their health unit region, less than half agreed it was a priority for their health units. Legally, clinics that we surveyed um, had similar challenges. They refer uh, callers often to local bylaws, the landlord and local public health departments. They identified their most common challenge as like confounding factors like mental health, landlord-tenant relationships, and, and hoarding were given as examples. They also mentioned challenges of getting health departments involved in addressing some issues that they felt were health hazards and also with a lack of follow-up by the landlord-tenant board to ensure orders to landlords were followed up. 80-90% of the legal aid clinics felt that legislative reform is needed, whether it's local bylaws, the HPPA, or the Residential Tenancies Act. Our frontline social service workers survey, these are often the first point of contact for tenants and a trusted source of information. The majority of them had worked with clients who had experienced unhealthy housing conditions, and while they agreed they have a role, they also identified they don't have the resources to help resolve these conditions. We also uh, surveyed small-scale landlords, so we had 124 responses, and the purpose was to understand the landlord's views and challenges in maintaining healthy rental housing. More than one-third, sorry, I think I moved the slide ahead, I'll just go back. More than one-third of the, um, the respondents said that at least one of their units needed repair, and 9% said that at least one unit was in need of significant repair. The top five issues they identified were flooding and other plumbing issues, structural issues, noise, rodents, and mold. And they also identified that they were unclear of the, various, the role of various agencies in helping landlords to ensure healthy housing. So Bob will now speak to the preliminary results of the Municipal Property Standards by law enforcement. Thanks, Helen, and hello, everybody. Um, the Rent Safe Survey of Property Standards and Municipal Law Enforcement Officers is the most recent of the sector surveys conducted by Rent Safe. It was developed in collaboration with the executive branch of both the Ontario Association of Property Standards Officers and the Municipal Law Enforcement Officers Association of Ontario, which are the two representative associations of bylaw enforcement officers and property standards officers. And it was completed by SurveyMonkey between October 5th and October 26th of this year, so a very recent study just completed. Uh, membership in both the organizations as well includes both frontline staff and managers, so that means that at the end of the full analysis, we'll be able to get a perspective on, on what both of those groups think within that sector. The survey, the broad survey objectives were to learn about officers' experience with complaints and concerns about conditions in rental housing, gather perspectives on the sector's, sector's capacities and challenges in supporting safe and healthy rental housing conditions, and most importantly, inform potential collaborative initiatives between municipal law enforcement and public health. The question, questionnaire that went out was very detailed, and again, it was developed in collaboration with people who are actually by law enforcement and property standards officers. It covered a range of questions that range from things like the types of issues and complaints typically encountered by municipalities, the degree to which there is already local collaboration with other agencies uh, going on, referrals, and just general opinions about the degree to which the system is working right now and how it might be made to work better. Because the survey only closed three weeks ago, there hasn't been the opportunity to do a really detailed analysis, so we'll only be able to provide you with some really high-level, um, broad key findings at this point. And those are 57% of the respondents agreed that substandard housing conditions are adversely affecting the mental and or physical health of local marginalized populations. 
68 percent agreed that confounding factors such as mental health or addiction, landlord-tenant relations, issues such as hoarding, which tracks back to mental health, is challenging their ability to respond effectively to complaints about substandard housing. 62% did agree that they collaborate, already collaborate effectively with other agencies. However, 75% agreed that, that they could actually probably collaborate better and that while there was good collaboration going on right now, there was certainly room for improvement, room for doing other things. So these findings I think are really encouraging. They align really well with the uh, results of the other sector surveys that RentSafe did and that Helen described briefly to us. And I think that that 62 and 75 percent bullets there about collaboration I think really point to the opportunity uh, to work really well with this sector and, and look at uh, different strategies that we can be using to, to be more effective in, in both of our works. So the next steps are the development of a detailed report. Again, there needs to be a detailed analysis at this point. And then sharing, of course, with the association members and other relevant partners, which are probably many of the people listening to this webinar today. And I'd also like to send a thanks out to Alana Lackley and Virginia McFarland, the epidemiologist and data analyst, respectively, at the Great Goose Health Unit for doing the survey formatting on SurveyMonkey and also for this high-level analysis that allowed us to speak to the results today. So thank you, Alana and Virginia, if you're out there. So we'll move on now to some examples, again, of, of municipal, already occurring municipal and public health liaison. The idea here, I think, is to provide listeners with some general ideas and examples of things that they may want to start doing themselves. And the fact that we're describing three, only three health units today isn't to imply that there aren't other health units out there that are already doing this kind of work, and it would be interesting to hear from them and, and, and being able to in some way share their examples. We'll start with Gray Bruce. Um, Gray Bruce's involvement with working with um, upstream housing issues started back in 2014, and it coincided with the health unit's affiliation with RentSafe that began that year. And the motivation was really that at Gray Bruce they were beginning to see that when we were responding to health complaint or to housing complaints, we were getting into this kind of revolving cycle where we were we were putting a band-aid on or acting in a reactive way, but we weren't really looking at root causes. So the plan at that point was to try to look upstream and look for other options. So that began with a lot of collaboration at that point with uh, landlords, tenants, and also with local property standards. And with regard to property standards, the objectives were to increase mutual understanding and appreciation of challenges, roles, and responsibility, and also explore opportunities for collaborative action to potentially increase effectiveness and efficiency. So the initial reach out was back in 2014, and that started out with a survey of the 17, yes, we have 17 local municipalities in Grey Bruce, of property standards officers and CBOs in late 2014. And it was very much a survey of like the, the broad-based one that RentSafe has just done, only a slight mini version, but again, trying to get at the same type of information about types of complaints, challenges being faced, et cetera. And that was followed up in 2015 with a uh, focus group session with both interested property standards officers from those municipalities and also PHIs from the Great Bruce Health Unit. The key findings at that point were, not surprisingly, there was a wide variation in the scope of property standards bylaws among those 17 municipalities, wide variation in enforcement resources and priorities, significant overlap in complaints received by municipalities and public health, significant uncertainty about who does what, is it a public health issue, is it a property standards issue, who should be responding, and also bolded the last bolded one, significant in improving connections between municipalities and public health. And I think it was that finding from the consultation that really made us want to move forward with um, increased partnership with, the, uh, with property standards. So from that, um, and this was really through uh, a suggestion of one of the property standards officers who happened to be the president of the local chapter of the Ontario Association of Property Standards of Ontario, was to come to one of the local chapter meetings, which we did. We gave a presentation called Housing and Health, a Role for Public Health and Property Standards, which was uh, greeted with real interest and enthusiasm by the membership that was there. And that led to the establishment of regular attendance by public health at local OAPSO meetings. Uh, the health unit actually has, in fact, offered the office and it's been used as a venue for these, for these meetings. 
And as well as just attendance at the meetings, there's been a number of joint information sessions or workshops held as well. Some of those are the component of the meeting, some of those that stand alone. Examples of those, once was a full day um, workshop on mold management and remediation that also went into the legislation. We also had someone from a local mental health agency in the Grey Bruce area who came and spoke about engaging effectively with tenants who are living with mental health and addiction. And also someone from local legal aid who provided an overview of the Residential Tenancy Act and its relevant to complaint response. So as well as the content information as well from the attendance of the meetings and these workshops, almost as, as importantly is that it provides you know, an, an opportunity for PHIs and municipal staff to connect informally and just kind of share ideas and viewpoints about you know, what's going on in their world and, and how they might be able to work more effectively. Uh, one last initiative that Grey Bruce currently has on the go as well is looking at um, advocacy around bylaw language among the local municipalities in the health unit area. And one of the things, one of those key findings, if we went back two or three slides, was that there, there was a significant range of scope in the different types of, or in the different property standards bylaws in the area. And what we wanted to do was, and the health promotion staff at Grey Bruce Health Unit did this was review, do a full review of the local standards, property standards bylaws among those municipalities to assess the language related to conditions that are known to contribute to adverse health outcomes. And the three that we focused in on was mold and dampness, pests and vermin, and inadequate heat. And that review found that with the exception of inadequate heat, language was often missing or did not speak to remediation of existing conditions. And what that means is, again, it was either missing altogether or there may be language that would say that a property must be maintained so as to ensure that um, there are no damp or, or moldy conditions. However, there was no language about it should those conditions actually be in place, what would be done in order to compel an owner of the building to remediate it. So looking at that, we felt that there was a little bit of a gap we could work on. So working with the legal unit, the, the health unit's legal counsel team, as well as a couple of interested property standards officers from the local municipalities, we crafted sample language around these three, or around the first two, around mold and dampness and pets and vermin. And right now there's a process underway to promote this language to the local municipalities as bylaws come up for review. Uh, we don't have the time right now, but just to give you a little bit of an idea, this is the draft sample language around mold and dampness. I won't read the whole thing out in the interest of time. However, I will read the one bolded paragraph which says, no person shall occupy or permit the occupancy of any building or portion thereof except an accessory building where an accumulation of mold exists which could pose a health hazard to any person who occupies the building or portion thereof. Now, I'm quite sure that a lot of the listeners out there working for health units are probably raising their eyebrows at that one as they think about anyone going down that murky road of trying to prove that uh, a, a certain accumulation of mold is actually a health hazard and maybe have already been down that road. And I think this is a good segue to turn it over to John Burnett from Niagara Region, uh, whose health unit is just looking at such an initiative. Okay. Thank you, Bob. So. Um I'm John Burnett with Niagara Region, and I'll just give you a bit of a brief overview of what we have uh, uh, been doing to really approach some uh, mold uh, in housing uh, problems. We did recognize for quite a period of time that our response really was probably not the most effective. And back in 2015, we started to look at how we can better approach things. So we did realize that most of those uh, complaints were coming from people from the lower sector, social economic status in our community, uh, areas in our communities. Um, they were um, single parents, new immigrants, individuals with families, uh, our families on benefits. Most of these people have had very few resources. We did realize that there were health effects on almost all those complaints that were coming in, but the only standard that we had was a bit of a dated one, and it was three meters squared, which is larger than the size of three sheets of plywood, a four by eight sheet of plywood. And that was not really um, an effective standard. We'd only ever seen that kind of a situation three times over about an eight year period of time that we look back at. And there was um, health effects certainly well below that. And we also realized that we were partners. Uh, we have a great overlap with our property standards officials, but we weren't really successfully working very well with them. And 
a complaint, not uncommon for a complaint to come in, and we would think it might be landed best at the municipal level, and the complainant tell us that they were, they were referred to us from that municipal level. And so we really were kind of thought we, we have to find a better approach. So anyway, we did a little bit of, uh, had our students actually, um, and our uh, data analyst put some uh, information together for us, and this is data from 2011 to 2013, but the Onmar deprivation chart um, mapping that was, uh, we went through, the darker um, the area, the higher the um, deprivation index, and the blue dots are mold complaints. The bigger the dot, the more the mold complaints, and if you look, you can see that they're, they kind of overlap each other. So the higher the deprivation index, the uh, higher, the more the mold complaints. And same with the residential instability. And I believe one of those indexes, the um, material deprivation, does actually include uh, living and dwellings that are in need of um, major repair. It has one of the indexes that they uh, run through from the um, census uh, information. So. That being said, we, uh, it led us into some research, and quite a bit of research, and we started with the health concerns. So internal and external, we, uh, we had a researcher on staff at that time in 2015, and what we were finding was rather than back in the 1990s when I think some concerns were really surfacing about um, the association between mold and health impacts, that uh, at the time, I think we, we had this uh, three meter squared index as an area for concern and people who were having impacts at less than that level, we initially thought that they were just people with uh, high sensitivities. And I think as time's gone on, um, we haven't changed much of our approach, but we were realizing that there was a pretty strong connection between asthma in particular and uh, asthma in children uh, as one of those uh, concerns that there was a link and links to respiratory symptoms, particularly congestion, eye irritation, and that mold can be for headaches and migraines. So in doing this research, um, we realized those links are there, and some of them can be pretty strong, depending on the data that we looked at, and what levels of mold, and this is the big question, is acceptable or safe? And in doing that, I, I think I turned back to one of our researchers uh, who actually spoke at one of these a few years back, Mark, Dr. Mark Mandel. And one of his comments, it's very hard to uh, make an established uh, standard when we don't really know what needs to be measured. That uh, the causal agents are truly not really fully recognized. The uh, stat statubatris as a smoking gun, which we kind of thought so back in the early 90s, it's much more complex than that. And um, but how do we establish any kind of a specific standard? So we went looking for that. And um, at one time, back in the uh, early 90s, uh, the CMHC guide and uh, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene did refer to three square meters as a standard and um, where the health impacts would be, uh, could be expected. In our research, so determined that long ago that reference point was not really uh, a good reference point, that the knowledge that was based on was quite outdated. And it was much more complex. So nowadays, three meters squared is referred to as extensive and not a specific benchmark of any kind. And it was really only three times that we'd ever had it, and those were all flooding incidences. And personally, I found it hard to even walk through the doors of the place, uh, let alone that uh, you know live inside a building that would have that much mold inside of it. So we tried to find some established standards, and through all our research, we weren't able to find any. Um, even be able to test molds, we can determine if it's heavy or if there's it's light, but we can't really come up with a specific, here's a line in the sand of where it's safe and where it's not. Common dilemma, the one thing that we do know is that uh, where there's mold, there's moisture. Where there's moisture, you're going to have mold. And so reduce moisture and you reduce your mold, uh, your mold problems. Hence, in looking at our overlaps with the municipalities, um, the uh, moisture sources um, can often be related to a building structure. And our municipal partners, our property standards officers, can often help with that. Or we have overlapping areas. Um, 
One of the things that we did in our research was sat down and looked at the legislation across each of our 12 municipalities. And we did actually, uh, one of our health inspectors, Ryan Bass, he did compile all that information, put it into a nice chart, and we keep that on our intranet as a reference. And the inspectors out in the field have access to that intranet site and uh, always have it as a reference. We use that because, as Bob was speaking to earlier, those um, property standards bylaws are really quite varied, and amongst our 12 municipalities, it's much the same too. And the application of them does vary. So I mean, some of the problems that we found, some um, obvious things, one municipality that had actual engineers on staff, um, structural mediations, they, um, that municipality said they won't, uh, some of them they won't address. They would only look at remediation of the mold itself. We thought we'd, with a professional engineer, we might have some great ability to uh, look at remediation, structural remediation with them, but Anyway, it didn't happen. Just some of the different things we found. Downspouts, which we thought would have been an obvious structural deficiency that would be required on the property standards level, um, that's not necessarily uh, required around, it varied around our 12 municipalities. A downspout being from the east troughs where the water uh, flows and is uh, drifted away from the uh, building itself, that um, may or may not actually appear in the uh, local um, municipal legislation. So what we did at that point, we met with each municipality with our staff together and looked at, amongst other things which have been uh, discussed before too, the rats, the rodents, um, bed bugs, um, a few of the other issues. We tried to look at uh, common approaches or how we might be able to really effectively tackle some of these issues. And, and overall, that was probably the most productive thing that we have done out of, out of all of this and looked at how uh, we can really tackle mold complaints and effectively and with the limitations of uh, legislation that's out there in really looking at uh, structural issues to resolve uh, moisture problems which often is there in those lower socioeconomic uh, communities. So two things that we found as concerns though with our local municipalities we take complaints over the phone, but our municipalities like complaints in writing, and two of our municipalities in particular want the complainants to send something in writing to their landlords or superintendents. Some issues that we brought up with that, this is just something in those meetings that we found some ways around that I thought it would highlight. And of course, in those really uh, difficult communities, Ill um, illiterate, uh, we do have people who are illiterate, and they may not be able to put their complaints in writing. New immigrants who may not have a good handle on reading and writing English may not, uh, we know cannot submit complaints. People with uh, cognitive impairments, they can't submit the complaints. Um, and it's common for tenants in uh, those poor communities to not necessarily have contact information for the superintendent or the landlord. We, we did find some great opportunities, and actually uh, one of the municipalities took it to the council uh, to look at ways of uh, getting around that so and dealing with it. So they will accept complaints forwarded to us uh, in those overlaps if we ask them to request them. So anyway, um, some great common uh, grounds. And one of the issues particularly whether it's that two-week uh, lag of contacting the landlord, when they're flooding our backup, we thought that could just be really very reasonable to ask somebody to wait around that long before um, see if the landlord's going to respond. So the municipalities have been really good about um, dealing with these issues and bypassing what may be in their uh, bylaws or fast tracking them anyways. So all in all we decided when how do we, um, we put together a bit of an algorithm on how to when to conduct a sign on site inspection. There's always a telephone interview at first and the idea of that was to screen out where there might just be some uh, frosting on a window, uh, some condensate in winter time. That's not necessarily needing an on-call, but we did establish some standards where we will go out on call, and that is if somebody is under 16 years old, uh, there's an, uh, living at that residence, someone's immunocompromised, someone with cognitive impairments, and someone uh, who may be pregnant will go on site and conduct an inspection and do a review. Um, when on site, we look at the potential sources of moisture, assess the mold, advise on the treatment, and how to address the mold uh, moisture issues. There's a great guide from the CMHC. We give it out to people. Um, it is Fighting Mold, the Homeowner's Guide. It addresses both how to uh, treat the mold and how to reduce the sources in your home 
We passed it out, posted on the website. The same information we give um, on site is there on our website. We will speak to the landlords and property management if they have a role in the remediation. Most often it is, and if the tenants will permit us. There often is a great fear in those communities of um, um, repercussion if they do um, send something, uh, do allow us to go forward. So, and of course, we refer the municipalities when they have a role. And ourselves are most often the tenant so that they can give the details that are needed for the complaint. Either or. So, um, a couple of issues that we just wanted to bring up that uh, other resources that down, um, the tenants have. It's usually multiple issues going on and those uh, barriers. The housing tribunal can be quite a barrier. Gathering evidence is an everyday knowledge. The, some of, some of, serving your a landlord a summons to appear is not something that's very easily done by people, everyday common knowledge. Uh, it doesn't exist out there and it's easier said than done. Um, even the cost of an application can be tricky to, to cover for people who are on pensions and maybe the, and the working poor. Access to the housing tribunal itself, uh, there's one location in Niagara and if you don't have a car, it's pretty hard to get there when it's 30, 40 kilometers away. So there's some huge barriers. One thing we did find is assistance to people there. Um, Niagara seems to split its legal um, uh, access or legal associations into a Niagara North uh, program and a Niagara South jurisdiction. So um, we have uh, they will help represent people, and it's just something that we've had as a great resource to refer people to. So the big issue is when do we issue an order, and with all the evidence, that three meter squares is not really, is just not reasonable. A lot of uh, research that allowed us to come up with the size of 0 0.2 square meters, size uh, pretty much of four square pieces of paper, and if that's existing in a high exposure area, we will uh, issue an order. It's been very few times that we've been um, push to the point of issuing an order, and we also um, require a test of our staff if we're going to issue the order to validate that what we're looking at truly is mold, not just our word as experts, but we wanted to validate it too. So that being said, we put everything into a little bit of a chart here as a reference if you wanted to take a look at it and how we respond to mold complaints. That being said, I'll turn it over to Victoria. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, so this is Victoria, and I will speak to uh, meeting highlights between York Region Public Health and the region's nine local municipal property standards departments. The York Region's Healthy Environments team was inspired to host the meeting because of the new 2018 OPHS Healthy Environments and Climate Change Guidelines, great work by other public health units, and our own experiences responding to housing complaints. The goal of the meeting was to better understand the role of each respective agency plays in responding to housing complaints and the barriers and challenges they face in responding to these complaints. The hope was, with better understanding, we could then explore ways to collaboratively respond to housing space in your region, providing a better service to our residents while producing better outcomes and or solutions. This meeting was the first time the Healthy Environments team had met face-to-face -face with most of the property standards managers. So in the spirit of relationship building, we decided to begin the meeting with a light lunch, providing the attendees an opportunity to meet and have discussions in a relaxed way. We wanted to make sure property standards staff were comfortable to speak up and provide feedback or ask questions throughout the business portion of the meeting, which can be difficult when meeting for the first time. The lunch also provided a chance for the late arrivals to still be on time for the formal portion of the meeting. When planning for the meeting, we were happy with the level of interest among property standards managers, which translated to attendance from each of the nine municipalities. Although there are many similarities between the municipalities, there are also differences, and it was important that we heard the perspectives of each of our nine local municipal property standards departments. Interestingly, we learned that the northern six municipalities, which are smaller in population size and some with rural areas, often meet separately from the southern three municipalities, which are decidedly urban and have the largest population sizes closest to Toronto. This was something that was important to consider for future planning and collaboration. The meeting's agenda was led by the Healthy Environments team. The agenda began with a quick overview of York Region Public Health, 
our um, organizational structure and health protection programs and services. We thought it was important to explain how the Healthy Environments Team and property standards relates to and intersects with the other programs and services within the Health Protection Division and public health as a whole. We provided an overview of York Region Public Health's role in responding to housing complaints and our mandate to do so in the standards. We highlighted the newest changes, including the Healthy Environments and Climate Change Guidelines, which encourages collaboration with municipalities to support policy changes and, for example, review of local property standards, bylaws, and housing conditions. This was followed by a brief description of the Rent Safe Initiative, and we ended the meeting with a discussion around collaborative opportunities and connections between municipal property standards and your region public health. The meeting's discussions highlighted common goals and barriers and the need for cross-agency training. Uh, cross Discussions revealed that on both sides, there was a misconception on which agency, public health or property standards, had the most effective legal tools in their enforcement toolbox to deal with housing complaints. We had the perception that the local property standards bylaws are prescriptive, and the compliance of these bylaws, uh, for example, the structural requirements, help prevent poor indoor air quality, mold, entry, pests, and other issues. But property standards managers explained that all prescriptive, orders issued to landlords due to bylaw violations can be appealed and the process lengthy, delaying action by the landlord and frustration of the tenant. On the other hand, property standards managers had a perception that the Section 13 order under the Health Protection and Promotion Act could lead to immediate action and remediation by the landlord. We explained that the HPPA is not prescriptive, meaning there is no specific regulation that deals with housing issues in the Act. Consultation with legal counsel would be required to ensure the application um, of the order, uh, Section 13 order, meets the definition of a general health hazard. York Region has not issued a Section 13 order. Instead, conducts on-site inspections with the landlord and tenant followed by a letter issued to the landlord outlining the inspection findings and required remediation actions. It was also interesting to learn that property standards officials were reluctant to conduct on-site inspections of rental housing with visible mold. There was a concern over the health effects of an occupational mold exposure. This is important to note when considering a joint inspection approach to responding to housing complaints that may include mold. This conversation identified the need for cross-training in mold, remedi mold remediation and regulation, such as the Ontario Building Code, Code, Municipal Code, Residential Tenancies Act, the Local Bylaws, and the HPPA. Both agencies agreed that confounding factors such as mental health and tenant-landlord relationships can be a barrier to responding effectively to housing complaints. We discussed the potential of policy mental health training for both inspectors and property standard officials. It was also acknowledged that York Region does not have an intersectoral program to effectively deal with bed bug complaints. The new cannabis regulation was a concern and was also mentioned, and the potential influx of housing complaints related to homegrown cannabis and smoking in multi-unit dwellings and how to respond. Lastly, it was agreed by all that in order to ensure better customer service to tenants and residents, there is a need for consistency in key messages and clear referral criteria between agencies, reducing confusion and prevent, preventing the dreaded bounce between agencies with no action. So in summary, collaboration between agencies requires openness, relationship building, changing of misconceptions, understanding of limitations and barriers in differing mandates and cross-training. I'll turn it over to Helen. Thanks, Victoria, John, and Bob for providing some examples from the field. I'm going to jump back to rent, the Rent Safe Initiative for a few minutes as the findings and recommendations reflect some of the work that's happening in, in the field, as, as the work between the municipalities and the health unit. So the Rent Safe final report towards healthy housing for all presents research findings over the past three years, and it summarizes input and perspectives of over 1,000 people across the province who have participated in our rent safe surveys, in focus groups, or in some of our intersectoral meetings. It's available online at rentsafe.ca. You'll see in the next slide. So the report outlines five key recommendations and also includes 
specific action to support those. The first one is to strengthen intersectoral capacity among service providers. The second, strengthen the legal base for the right to healthy housing for all. And one example given is to update municipal bylaws for healthy housing. The third, improve knowledge, research, and data. One example being providing more data on housing conditions, perhaps a provincial database about housing conditions across Ontario. The fourth, educate and empower, so to equip all sectors for success, including tenants, landlords, and service providers. So for example, tenants, providing them resources to help them understand how to navigate the system, the various sectors, uh, service provider sectors, to understand the mandates of the various agencies and some of the resources that they can use. And the last one is to create a unified vision to the, of the right to healthy, adequate housing and apply a health equity lens to address the drivers of housing inadequacy. So one example of RentSafe's ongoing work is the RentSafe Connector tool. The tool was developed in response to our research that revealed gaps and disconnects with respect to coordination of services across sectors. We recognize that building strong coordination and relationships across sectors at the local level is essential to tackling the ever-growing concern about the vulnerable population's experience of an adequate, unsafe, and unhealthy housing con conditions that serve to perpetuate health inequities. And through um, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Association's National Housing Strategy, we've applied for a grant to pilot the Rent Safe Connector in three communities. We're hoping to hear in the next month whether or not we receive that grant. And the purpose of this pilot would be gain to community-level experience with a potentially impactful and user-friendly tool to catalyze collaboration across diverse sectors to better support the right to healthy housing. So we're hoping to research or to pilot this in three communities across Ontario to further develop the tool based on the experiences of those pilot communities and to disseminate the revised connector tool to public health and other sectors. And we also encourage, we will send this information out once we determine if we're getting the funding, and we would encourage health units to consider um, being one of those communities that we're going to be using. And in summary, summary of all of our presentations and the information that you've heard today, housing conditions impact the health and well-being of residents in numerous ways, including exacerbating existing health inequalities. And collaboration across multiple sectors is key to ensuring healthy housing for all, and it starts with relationship building and a better understanding of the various uh, roles and challenges that each of our agencies are facing. And finally, Public health has a vital role to play. Um, we've done this across uh, many issues, whether it's in partnership building or facilitation, health promotion, health protection, research, or advocacy. So now we will open it up to questions from the audience. While people are typing, I just want to thank uh, Victoria, Helen, Bob, and John. Um, I think the work that Rent Safe and your prospective health units um, are doing in regards to substandard housing is really truly inspiring. Um, and I also agree that there's a big gap in legislation surrounding housing complaints. Um, hopefully, the work that you all are doing will kind of um, help to minimize those gaps and solve some of the issues we're facing. We have an, a question out there. Um, who do we contact if we're interested in the grant initiative? Hi, so this is Helen, um, and I think I didn't put up the last slide, but um, I'm hoping that slides will be shared with uh, the audience. So the last slide um, lists each of our names and our email contact addresses, and we've all um, agreed that we would uh, be willing to, to um, respond to any questions anyone has after the webinar. So um, if you are interested in it, we haven't received the, the grant yet. We're very hopeful, crossing our fingers, that we are going to receive that grant. And once we do, we're going to be sending um, a request for health units to apply for, to be one of those pilot communities. So we'll be sending it out to all health units. Um, but if you're interested individually and you want to share your name with me, I'll certainly add you to the list. 
And we'll also let you know, if we don't get that grant, we know there are other opportunities and we, we certainly do want to pursue them too because we, we've, we've gained so much momentum and certainly commitment across sectors to work together and we know that this would be a valuable tool for municipalities and health units. Okay, so we have another question here, Jonas, for you. For the assessment of health concerns in your review, were, there self -reported, were these self-reported by the client or was there a requirement for assessment by a family physician? Uh, it was more over a period of time of our observations that a typical complaint, it rarely did a complaint come in without a health concern attached to it. Um, when we did take proceedings or um, ending up in the housing tribunal with them, that was just something, that was something we always asked them was to have something backed up with a uh, family physician. But we certainly did receive a few complaints through um, from uh, a couple actually came from physicians themselves, not very many, but um, and a, a few um, people did bring the supporting evidence with the complaints too. Okay, so there's another question. Um, for the survey that was conducted in Grey Bruce on SurveyMonkey, was this survey targeted towards low SES individuals or bylaw officials? Yes, thanks Renee for your question. Yeah, the, the survey was specifically targeted for bylaw officials, so it went out, uh, the link was sent out by email to each of the municipalities, so it wasn't a survey for tenants. Um, we did, as I mentioned, we did some parallel consultation with both landlords and tenants, but recognizing some of the, um, the difficulties for, it might be for low SES individuals to access it, we did a series of focus group sessions for that particular group. So it was done in, in, a, in a totally different way, recognizing that there may be a potential for bias or people being unable to access it. And the result of that would be probably enough for a presentation another day, so. Uh, there was another question too about the webinar being um, recorded. So it is recorded, like we had mentioned, and it will also, we have the consent from the speaker, so it will be on the Sci-Fi Ontario YouTube channel as well. So you can uh, go to that through YouTube and subscribe and you can see when a, any new video is posted. Um, Helen, did you say you were going to put up contact info? I guess it's already up there. Um, so Helen's info is up there as well, her, her direct email there. Any other questions? Yeah. I, this is Helen. I was just going to mention too, um, with respect to the CMHC National Housing Strategy Grant that we applied for, um, the Canadian Partnership of Children's Health and the Environment were a co-applicant with the Ontario Public Health Association. So um, the Ontario Public Health Association, as a co-lead, you would, if you're a member of OPHA, you would certainly um, find out more information about it from OPHA or through your health unit. Are there any more questions? Okay, looks like there's one more. Um, in terms of collecting data on housing conditions, are there any current initiatives? Could PHO take the lead on coordinating with public health units? So this is Helen. Um, so one of the things that just in some of the research I did as we prepared for this presentation that I, I wasn't aware of was the, the key health indicators report from the Public Health Agency of Canada. I didn't realize that housing conditions was one of the top key health indicators. So I, I think that that's, and, and one of the other things that that report um, identified was the need to continue to monitor and measure housing conditions in order to be able to, to address it. And that certainly was one of the recommendations that came out of the RentSafe report. So certainly um, OPHA and the RentSafe initiative would be very willing if there's a, a way of helping with identifying what kind of information we want to collect. I think we've, we've got a good start with a lot of the surveys that we've conducted with the various sectors, and we certainly have a lot of momentum built to go forward doing that. So if others are interested, um, we could work together with them on that. Okay. Um, it looks like there's one more person maybe typing. Okay. So I would like to thank everyone on the webinar who joined us today for the Sci-Fi Seminar Series. It is great to have such wonderful participation online, and I would like to thank Helen, Bob, Victoria, and John for presenting. Um, please ensure to complete the evaluation from this session that you will get after um, this is completed. 
And I also ask that you reflect on how the information provided in this session can be used in your current work setting. So thank you, everyone, and have a nice day.